Britain's deserts are indeed turning black. The uplands of the UK are ecological wastelands, barren, treeless, and now scorched. They're known as biological deserts due to the monoculture of grass and severe erosion that's taking place here. Everywhere you look here, you can just see that the land is falling apart. You shouldn't be able to see this much exposed earth. You can feel it's been burnt, the peat has been burning here. This is a chronically sick landscape that's now burning down to nothing. It's only April and we've seen many so-called wildfires breaking out across the UK. So far, media coverage has focused on the climate, on the weather, with arson, discarded bottles, barbecues, and cigarettes getting the blame. While this might be true, this is only half the story. In this video, I'm gonna give you the full picture and explain what's really happening here. So I've come to Wales, the Cambrian mountains. This place is known as the Green Desert of Wales. That's because of its monoculture of grass and its barren and inaccessible nature. So I think the first question we should be asking is, is should the UK even have wildfires? So we're a country which is pretty well famous for our rainy weather, our gloomy gray skies, and not blazing heat. Unlike places like California, where wildfires are part of the ecosystem and their plants are adapted to these wildfires, our native plants here in Britain aren't. Historically, our landscapes were shaped by water, temperate rainforests, peat bogs, wetlands, wet woodlands. And if we were able to wind the clock back 8,000 years, this land, Britain, would have been one massive wet sponge, a very effective sponge. I very much would have liked to have been around to see that. So wildfires in Britain, are they natural? Well, no, they never used to be. They only really started showing up in any real frequency in you know, recent times. That's because we've changed the land, but also because the climate's changing too. For the last 10,000 years, Earth's climate has been relatively stable and it's given rise to everything that we see today, all of the progress which we've made. But this stability, this balance is breaking. Since the industrial revolution, our fossil fuel burning, our forest clearing and our land grabbing has pushed Earth into a new era, the Anthropocene where humans shape the planet more than any other natural force. And the, the consequences of this, they're already here. You know, we're seeing rising temperatures, wild swings in weather, and the rhythms of the seasons, you know, they're breaking down. And for the UK, this means that we're having wetter winters, but we're having hotter, drier summers. It really is a recipe for fire. But the climate is just part of the story. The land, the land has changed too. And this is where it gets really interesting. The shifting baseline syndrome. You've got it, your grandparents had it, your kids will have it. I used to have it, although now I'm aware of it, I'm able to keep it at bay. The shifting baseline syndrome is this ecological idea, this social phenomenon that with each new generation, we look at the landscape and we accept it as normal. Rivers filled with sewage and bare treeless burnt hills. If our children grow up and accept this as the norm, then we're in real trouble. You know, here in Britain, we have forgotten what thriving ecosystems look like. There really aren't any left. And when wildfires rip through landscapes like this, we don't really bat an eyelid. We don't really see it as a crisis. We don't realize what this landscape could be. There are so few native trees around here, but when there are, this is how they're able to hold on. This one is literally growing out of the rock. It's been able to evade grazing and, you know, it's showing signs of a, of a rainforest species. Look at these ferns. It's covered in lichens and mosses. You know, this is a clue of what could be here, what could be in this valley, but it's not. So what's really driven this landscape to be in such a vulnerable state? Well, it's really been a death by a thousand cuts over thousands of years. We drain land to farm it more easily. We've cleared forests to farm it more easily. We've introduced sheep, which let's be honest, are like biological lawn mowers. And we've pretty much burned, grazed, and extracted the land into submission. Just take a look at any of the UK uplands today. When it's not burnt to a singe like this, the dominant plant species is purple moor grass, millennia. It forms a monoculture because it's barely edible. Even the sheep only touch it when it's young and fresh. And how do landowners get rid of the dead millennia? Well, they very often burn it. And these controlled burns typically happen 
in April. And when are we seeing wildfires at their peak? Well, it's not during the hottest months of the year as you'd expect, it's during April. You know you can buy those uh, eco-friendly fire lighters. Well, this looks just like that. It's no wonder that this goes up in flames. And sometimes the goal of this isn't just to get rid of the dead millennia. We've burnt landscapes for a very long time and this is fundamentally done to halt ecological succession, to keep the trees away, to keep the scrub from forming. Fundamentally, it's about keeping the land open for activities like grouse shooting, because how can you shoot the grouse when there's trees in the way? So we are, by management, by design, actively suppressing the land. And you look, look, I'm not saying that it can't happen. I'm not saying that wildfires can't be started by discarding, you know, the odd bottle or a barbecue. Arson and all of that very much does happen. But I think we need to, you know, connect the dots here. We've turned what could be a lush, vibrant landscape into this, a fire-prone, treeless wasteland. But here's the thing. We don't have to accept this as normal. These dry, barren hills may be the only baseline that we've known, but they're not natural. They're not inevitable. We can choose better for the generations which come after us. And the good thing is, is that restoration is possible. This restoration is all about re-wetting the land because who'd have thought it? A wet landscape supports more life and they're not so prone to burning. And this can be achieved by blocking off drainage ditches to raise the water table and allow these landscapes to become the lush, spongy habitats that, that they once were. Now this, this is what we want to see more of. Look at that beautifully wet, spongy sphagnum moss. This, this isn't going to burn. It didn't burn. So this is a patch of dry grass which didn't burn. Literally over here, you can see where it did burn. The reason why it didn't burn is because of this. It's surrounded by sphagnum moss. But beyond this, we need to restore native vegetation. We need to reduce grazing and burning pressures so the landscape has space to recover. And over time, we get more complex, we get more biodiverse and fire resilient ecosystems instead of just a monoculture of flammable millennia grass. Now, you might think that letting scrub and trees grow back is just more stuff to burn, but actually, the opposite is true. You see, a monoculture of dry, dead grass like millennia creates a thick carpet of flammable material. Whereas if you have a landscape which is more open in areas, there's trees, there's scrubs, there's vegetation at different heights, there's more moisture in the soils, it's just not going to burn as fast and as easily. In short, a healthier, messier, wetter landscape is less likely to go up in flames than a dry, uniform one. This isn't just about environmental repair. This is also about building climate resilience. This is about bringing back what we've lost and not accepting dry, burnt landscapes as the norm. You know, what I found in my work is that nature restoration, it often isn't rocket science. But what is often missing is engagement, but also, crucially, funding. And for nearly a year now, I've been working with rewilding organization Planet Wild. They run a community-funded membership that brings regular people together around a shared goal to make the planet wilder. I'm a member myself and I've loved seeing how their projects grow because each month there is a new rewilding mission and each one gets featured on their YouTube channel. Their projects focus on achieving real tangible goals, not only restoring habitats and helping species return, but also improving the lives of the people who live in those landscapes. It's this holistic approach which I personally really value most because I think it's fundamental to making long lasting change. So I'm just checking in the app. Yeah, their membership has nearly 12,000 people globally. This is something which anybody can be a part of no matter where you are and what you can contribute. But if you're unsure about signing up, I really do recommend checking out their YouTube channel. It is the best way to learn about them. Their most recent project is all about restoring the habitat of the incredible monarch butterfly. Every year, millions fly 3,000 miles from Canada to Mexico, one of nature's greatest migrations. But their winter forests are under threat from climate change and illegal logging. But thanks to the Planet Wild community, they've teamed up with WWF to help restore these vital habitats. You can check out that video, I've linked it in the description. But if you do want to sign up, I've got an exclusive offer for you. The first 150 people to sign up using the link in the description or the comments or the QR code on screen will get their first month of membership completely free. That means that you can start helping nature today and it won't cost you anything.
Because when like-minded people come together to work toward a common goal, we will make a difference. And that's exactly what Planet Wild offer. It's very nice to hear the skylarks, but the smell here, the sights, it's, uh, it's really quite shocking. If you've enjoyed this video, if you've liked learning about what's happening, then please subscribe to Leave Curious. If you want to keep watching the channel, then check out the video that's on the screen now. Planet Wild's link there too, so go and check that out. In the meantime, thanks for watching. Leave Curious.